This is Office Hours, and I'm your host, Spencer Raskoff. I co-founded Zillow and ran it for a decade. And in early 2020, I co-founded .LA, the preeminent news service covering the tech scene in my hometown of Los Angeles. On this show, you'll hear from founders, CEOs, and thought leaders from around the world with a focus on the innovators in LA. Today on Office Hours, I'm speaking with Nick Green, CEO and co-founder of Thrive Market, about how to manage and build a mission-driven business. Thrive Market is the health-first membership for conscious living with a mission to make healthy and sustainable living easy, accessible, and affordable to every American family. This startup has received venture capital funding from Graycroft, Power Plant Ventures, Kavu Venture Partners, and Invis. Growing up in Minnesota, Nick Green witnessed the geographic and financial barriers that exist for families looking to buy healthier and more sustainable food products. After graduating from Harvard and selling his first company, Nick met his fellow co-founders who set their sights on solving America's food access problem. In 2020, Green donated his salary as CEO to the COVID-19 Relief Fund and was also selected as a national winner of Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Since their launch in 2014, Thrive Market has grown to 1.2 million paying members and 1,000 employees, becoming a case study example of how mission-driven companies can scale. Very excited to have you here. Nick Green, welcome to Office Hours. Thanks for having me. Nick, what was your first entrepreneurial experience? First entrepreneurial experience? Well, the, the very first was mowing lawns. So that was my... That, <laughs> nice. How, that how was old my, were you? How old were you when you started doing that? Uh, I've started mowing our, my own lawn was like you know, 10, 11. Uh, so I grew up in the Midwest, uh, had a very, uh, I'd say parents committed to creating a healthy work ethic. Um, and then I started probably when I was 12 or 13, doing it around the neighborhood and had like, you know, seven, eight, nine, probably 10 lawns, lawns at max. Do you remember how much you charged? Uh, it's 10 bucks for a small lawn. And 15 if I had to do the edging on the sidewalk, which nice. was like itself a, a, a you know double the time to mow that lawn. And did you ever get to the point of hiring people to work for your business, or you were a solo solo? I was a solo entrepreneur. yeah solopreneur on that one for sure. Um, you know my my first real entrepreneurial experience was actually my first company, which was an education company doing uh, SAT and ACT prep for high school kids. Hmm. Um, and that one I did you know eventually hire a lot of people. Uh, but sort of started similarly where I didn't want to get a summer job. And I was, I had been I, you know, tutoring kids when I was in high school uh, and uh, basically decided I'd run a course, um, you know, ended up with a hundred kids that signed up for the summer. So I, I taught four courses and the next you, summer. You I, were in college at the time or what? what uh, I just, I just graduated from high school okay. um, and I was going to start um, undergrad at Harvard. And so, you know, backing up again, I grew up in outside of Minneapolis, Minnesota, went to a big public school and, you know, grew up like middle-class, middle America, Midwest kind of thing. And was one of, you know, like a handful of kids that had gotten into an Ivy league school, uh, or the you know, prior years. And, and also one of the only kids in my area that had gotten done really well in the SAT. Um, so that was kind of, you know, the, the, the customers came to me, so to speak. And, right. uh, and I stumbled, like, I describe it as being an accidental entrepreneur because I stumbled into that, that business opportunity. And then the way it ended up growing is I hired after, after that second summer, when I hired kids in my own area to teach the classes, I went back to Harvard and I thought, God, there's how many undergrads are there at Harvard who could do the same thing in their communities. So I basically started, it's called Ivy Insiders. And we hired hmm. undergrads from places like Harvard and eventually the rest of the Ivies as well sent them back to their hometowns during the summer, uh, used our curriculum uh, as well as our business systems to run their own test prep kind of micro franchises. Um, and the, the model just exploded. We like, we cat, we peaked at like 800 branches around the country. Wow. Um, Did you, you raise know, so, any capital for that business or it was totally bootstrapped? It sounds like totally a pretty capital, yeah, capital total, light company. Very capital. I mean, it's a services business, right. um, but really, you know, scalable in a really interesting way because of that direct sales model where, we weren't hiring them just to be tutors. We were hiring them as, we call them branch managers and they'd actually run their own business for the summer. So the value prop to the undergrad was, you know, you get to be an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and build your business, but you get the head start of like a brand and a curriculum and a platform to do it on. And like I said, we scaled it really fast. And then we used, we ended up using those summer branches to basically seed online test prep during the school year. Um, and the interesting connection actually to, my current business, Thrive Market, is that 
that one, well, in a you know, totally different space was also focused on access. Mm-hmm. So like the whole thing was, you know, when I took the, the, the SAT, for example, I had never seen the SAT before. Like when, I took, the, when I took the PSAT, I'll say that. Okay. All I right. took the PSAT. <laughs> and when I took the, first, the SAT for the first time, I hadn't, I didn't study it all. Wow. Um, Amazing. Um, and, and I, are, do you, do you, you want to say what you got on the SAT or is that? I, I got a fifteen twenty the first time, nice. but I hadn't studied and I said, Hey, I can do better than that. So <laughs> I went back and I studied and I got a perfect score the second time. Wow. Um, but my big takeaway from that was like one, the SAT is a game. And right. then two, you know, when I got to Harvard, I met all these people that were, had, you know, were very, very smart, but also had been prepping mm-hmm. for things like the SAT since they were in middle school. And I thought, you know, God, it's crazy that people that can afford to hire tutors and do all this stuff, you know, get into places like Harvard. And there were a bunch of kids in my high school who were as smart as me, didn't do well on the test, largely because they didn't study. And, you know, the whole model was let's converge that. I want before before you tell us how Ivy Insiders ended up, like what happened with this company, I do have to share a quick SAT story. So I got a 1480 on the SAT and and I went to Harvard also. Uh, I'm a lot older than you, I think. Um, but I met my wife at Harvard and uh, she to this day has never told me her SAT score. It's the only secret that she has <laughs> kept from me. And it's the source of great marital strife and debate uh, and I'm know, sure she did all, better than you and doesn't want to hurt your feet. <laughs> the kids all have theories on it. Does that mean that it's because she did better? Does it mean she did a lot worse? I don't know. She won't tell. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, that's, uh, that's how I think of the SAT that's, from our I mean, Harvard experience. <laughs> that's great. And the truth is like, part of what we were trying to do is also like, you know, sort of defang the SAT of like, people think about it as an intelligence test, or they think about <laughs> it as this like important symbol of their worth as a human being. And it just shouldn't be at all. Right. Well, and it's test optional now, right? Most colleges. That's, oh, yeah, it is right. It isn't at this point, right? At this point, it doesn't so, matter. So what happened to your tutoring business? So we, yeah, like I said, we scaled it up and I ran it for three years after I graduated. Wow. Um, so, you know, kind of the short story there was I like, you know, I thought I was going to go do consulting or banking. I did a summer internship at McKinsey while running my test prep business. Hmm realized consulting was not for me, nor was probably working for anyone else but myself. And that caused me to say, all right, I'm going to do this full time. So we grew up for three years afterwards and got bought by a company called Revolution Prep uh, based here in LA. And that's what brought me to the West Coast. So I came here for the earnout. I didn't know that you were bought by Revolution Prep and Revolution Prep just sold pretty recently. They just got acquired. Yeah. In the last yeah. year or two. Um, Amazing. Um, th- that's an interesting story as well. Revolution Prep, as the founders explained it to me, they switched their whole business to online pre-COVID. Yeah. The business cr- really cratered because people weren't interested in in um, in doing online tutoring. And then when COVID happened, they were perfectly positioned, and so they rebounded in a huge way, and then had a really big exit. Did I get that right? Is that basically yeah that's basically right and it's like another one of those like you know overnight up trajectory but they ran that business for more than 15 years right you know, two of them <laughs> met in business school they bootstrapped the business initially um you know i was there back in the day when it was uh, all brick and mortar uh and then you know they did make that that hard pivot mm-hmm. and it seemed like crazy at the time but obviously you know paid off right big, big so you had an exit uh your fir- your first startup exit i assume you didn't sell the lawn mowing business so your first startup exit was in your early 20s uh yeah. just a couple of years out of college and and then keep us keep us going on your career path what happened next yeah so i was i was 25 when i moved out here uh i stayed at revolution prep for a year and a half um so i did the year now and then stayed a bit after that and it was that was actually the first time i'd ever worked for anyone else so that was an interesting experience and I think cool because it was still an entrepreneurial place. Um, so I was running product uh, and the tech team there. And so I got my first like experience building software, kind of exposure to, to tech. And then at the same time, there was kind of interesting stuff happening in LA as you know, the like Silicon Beach phenomenon began, really began. I, I don't know what, it, what, was going, what was going before that, but it was like, it felt like a lot of energy around startup accelerators and incubators and like a couple of you know VC funds that had, had recently launched. Mm-hmm. So uh, another friend of mine from college, Sam Teller, had recently joined up with the guys at Upfront to start a, um, a startup accelerator called Launchpad LA, mm-hmm. um, which is no longer exists, but did extraordinarily well. Like if you look at the portfolio companies that came out of that, that uh, accelerator, it's actually pretty amazing. Um, but I decided to join there as an entrepreneur residence 
and, you know, b- fancy way of saying, I didn't know what I was going to do next mm-hmm. and, you know, showed up every day and uh, got to meet a ton of founders and see a lot of companies and do some angel investing uh, and ultimately met my co-founder Gennar uh, and started Thrive. By the way, quick Sam Teller side note, when I moved back to LA six years ago, um, I started connecting with the LA tech community and um, I met Sam and about three years ago when we started .LA, he was one of the first supporters at the time. Um, if I remember correctly, he was Elon Musk's chief of staff and um, you know was there for a long time doing that. And he's just been a great friend of .LA and we've done a lot of investing together and, and he's he's one of those people that keeps the glue of the LA tech community together. Yeah, I was gonna uh, say, all, all roads lead to Sam. Exactly, uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, I didn't even know you worked at, at Launchpad LA with him, so amazing. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, what year are we in now when you decided to start Thrive Market and what was the founding insight that you had which caused you to start the company? Yeah, so that's, we're like mid 2013. Um, so, and I, had, you know, the prior year there, I had probably met, you know, 500 plus founders, done, you know, a dozen investments and had, you know, not met anyone that I wanted to work with. Um, Gennar actually pitched me initially on investing uh, in what at the time he was calling Shop Tribe. So uh, vision was to make Groupon for healthy food. And, you know, just to fast forward to Thrive, like our mission is let's make healthy living, healthy and sustainable living, easy, affordable, accessible to everybody. Um, that mission was basically intact before, even when he pitched me, uh, but the business model was very different. Uh, he was saying, you know, let's basically do group buying events where we can pool uh, resources from consumers uh, and like Groupon, get better deals on non-perishable CPG products. Um, the problem with the model, and we, we, we did test it, was that people don't want to wait, and this is like obvious in retrospect, they don't want to wait two or three weeks for their groceries. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, basically he pitched me and like, despite kind of the, weirdness in the business model that he wanted to do, pursue at the time, the vision was like crystal clear. Uh, and it just resonated with me super personally. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I had grown up, like I said, middle-class in the Midwest. So this is like back in the nineties when there was the, you know, carb-based food pyramid, fortified junk food, like, you know, two liter bottles of soda at dinner time kind of thing. Um, but I had a mom who was very different. Um, we were like that weird house in the block that had no, no soda, no sugared cereal. Um, and like, and her story actually is even you know more interesting. Like she came from a, a big Mexican American family. Um, and a lot of her siblings, cousins, parents, like it was diabetes, it was heart disease. It was all of these, what we now recognize as lifestyle diseases. And, you know, she basically was just hyper committed to changing that for, for her kids, for me and my siblings. Um, and like, we kind of hated her for it at the time because we <laughs> didn't get to eat any of the fun stuff that other people did, but, you know, looking back on it, you know, we're now, you know, health conscious and healthy and, you know, don't have any of these like supposedly, you know, genetically predisposed issues that a lot of our family members uh, did. Um, but then at the same time, I, I saw how hard she had to work to do it. Right. It was like doing it on a budget. There wasn't a health food retailer nearby, you know, the food pyramid, like I said, was completely messed up at the time. Um, so, you know, those things that, that left an impact on me. And when Gennar was pitching me on, uh, you know, let's make healthy living affordable to anybody or accessible to anybody. It was like, oh my gosh, it's exactly what I wish our family had had growing up. And the, the staggering thing to me at the time was that, you know, here we are 25 years later or 20 years later, and like more or less the same barriers my mom faced are still, or were still faced by most people in this country. It's like, you know, you don't live near a health food retailer. If you do, you can't afford it. And even if you can afford it, it's like, where do you start? It's intimidating. So, you know, that was, that was the vision. Break Um, those down. I, I've talked a lot about this and blogged a a lot about the importance of a founder having direct connectivity to the problem they're trying to solve, that there's no such thing as just a great founder. There's only a great founder for a specific idea. And if I told you to go start a real estate tech company, it might, you know, you might not be the right founder for that, but you're clearly the right founder for this mission based on your personal experience and connection to the problem. So for those that aren't familiar with how Thrive Market works today, just describe the company and the product today. 
Yeah. So today the mission is identical, make healthy and sustainable living, easy, affordable, accessible to anybody. I love that you can recite that off the tip of your tongue. That's also a sign of a great founder or somebody that knows their mission. Uh, Well, I'm so proud that that hasn't changed, right? That like, you know, Gennar start, he pitched me on that in 2013. And by the end of that meeting, I was pitching him on doing it together. (laughs) And that, you know, that through line has been constant. What did change was the business model. So we ended up ditching the Groupon model. And basically, you know, the way, the way a lot of people will describe us is like Whole Foods meets Costco meets Trader Joe's online. Mm -hmm. And initially it was really Whole Foods meets Costco membership model for the best selling highest quality natural organic food products that you would find in a place like Whole Foods. Um, It's all the, it's all non-perishable. So it's like, think about the center aisle of the grocery store as opposed to the perimeter. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's 50% of what people will buy at the, at the store. So you're not because selling vegetables uh, online. We're not selling. Well, we do sell, we do, we sell frozen vegetables. Okay. So that's one thing we've added. Got it. We do sell, um, uh, we actually sell like some fermented vegetables that could okay. be stored on perishably, but no, we don't, we're not going to sell your produce. You're right. Okay. Um, and at the beginning, we didn't sell any frozen either. It was like just mm-hmm. Snacks, supplements, home and home home goods, beauty products. Like how much is the annual membership? It's sixty dollars a year, same as Costco. Um, And and the idea was, you know, let's one, we'll make our margin off the membership so that we can then pass along savings to Mm -hmm. the, the the members. And the goal being, let's have the natural organic products at or below the price of the conventional equivalent. So let's get a kind bar at the price of a Snickers bar, non-toxic laundry detergent below the price of Tide, that kind of thing. What we really quickly found out is that that wasn't the only barrier we had to solve for. Uh, it was also like, how do we make it easy? I think, you know, when you think about a, a, a mom who's the, the primary shopper for on our, on our platform, you know, they've got, they've got kids, they've often got career They've got tons of other things going on. Mm -hmm. How can we make it really simple? And so a big part of what Thrive is, is not only great prices delivered to your door, but also ability to shop by your diet and lifestyle, use smart filters, have personalization, put everything on auto ship, get all of your products together versus like on Amazon where you're getting the onesie twosies delivered Mm -hmm. at different times and really streamline and simplify the process of living healthy. Give listeners a sense of the scale of the company. How big are you? Yeah. So we have about 1.2 million members today. Wow. Um, you know, last year we did over 400 million in sales. Um, we've, the, the Trader Joe's part has come in and that we now are also our own brand. Mm. So we sell all the best products and brands that you'd find at a place like Whole Foods, but we now also, you know, a quarter of our sales last year were from the Thrive Market brand. So that's a hundred million dollar brand now, uh, which has been really exciting. Um, and there we're like actually going up the supply chain further and kind of turning the traditional private label model on its head and that we're not just copycatting third-party brands. We're trying to innovate and, and basically find gaps in our catalog, mm-hmm. products that don't exist, quality standards that haven't been met, uh, and then bring those to our members and give them even better pricing. I'm very interested in the private label issue. And it's in the news right now because from an antitrust standpoint, Google and Amazon are being investigated, evaluated for biasing their own services, um, you know, with their own products. Um, I, I, you and I actually haven't talked about this, but I teach, I've been, I, two years ago, pre COVID, I taught an HBS course, um, on called managing tech ventures, where I taught case studies on Disney launching Disney plus and competing with its own suppliers for content. And then Netflix, moving into originals and competing with its own suppliers. So that's a media version of private label. And then as a Harvard College alum, you'll find you'll be excited to know that I taught a Harvard College course this semester, Startups from Idea to Exit, which was Harvard College's first ever class on startups. You know, when you and I were there, there was nothing. There was no curriculum at all on startups. Um, I mean, and so, I would, even a step further, there was no curriculum in anything like that was useful, real world related. <laughs> exactly. And they, and they were proud of it, right? Like, yes, that was they were. And they still kind of education. Still, I mean, it's still a liberal arts school at its core, but but there are these tiny little cracks uh, that, uh, you know, that that they're uh, that they're opening. And one of them was after my begging was uh, to teach a startups course. But anyway, in, in each of those courses at HBS and at Harvard College, I see, I taught, teach a lot about this private label issue and how you're competing with your partners. So how did you approach that? You know, just, just discuss more of that strategy decision that you went through. 
Yeah. I mean, it's a great question and one we, um, you know, wrung our hands about around a lot before we got into doing our own brand, um, principally because the stakes are even higher for us as a stakeholder driven business. So like, you know, we, from the very beginning, this was another thing that we kind of pulled from the whole foods playbook. You know, John Mackey wrote his, his like famous book, stakeholder, uh, conscious capitalism, all about, um, uh, all about stakeholder driven models. And, you know, we wanted to bake that into the business from the very beginning, which meant we're not just going to serve our, our customers. We're going to serve the environment. We're going to serve uh, uh, our, our mission around access. We're also going to serve our, our vendors as real stakeholders. Hmm. So we were ultra sensitive about not directly competing with them. We also realized really quickly that we were in a super unique position um, with the data that we have. Um, to do private label differently. So this is sort of what I was referring to on turning the model on its head, mm-hmm. where like traditionally, if you're in a grocery, if you're a grocery store, the main, the only data you have is what products are selling. And therefore, like you're going to copy the products that are selling. We have a lot of data on what things people are looking for, but not able to find, right? right. Or what things they're buying, but not satisfied with. And so we've used, again, the, the own brand platform as a way to fill gaps in the catalog to go out ahead on kind of the bleeding curve of, of, of innovation Mm -hmm. uh, and to do things that brands aren't doing. So what's an example of of that, that where you're filling in holes in the catalog? Uh, So, you know, for example, like we, even on a commoditized product, like with, uh, with olive oil, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, 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 U S sourced olive oil that is like a great product, California olive oil. Um, but there weren't single sourced olive oils. There's a lot of interest around single source supply chains. We went over to Crete, which is uh, an island, uh, part of Greece, oldest olive producing region in the world, partnered with a family, directly sourcing from them and brought basically a higher caliber olive oil that is single sourced, uh, that is that is organic, uh, and that we could actually price at a point that is even lower priced than the California olive oil. That's like one example. And in a sense, you are competing right? But you're filling a totally, you're filling a totally different uh, niche. And then in other cases, we're doing innovation where it's like totally like weird new products. So like we partnered with Beyond Meat to do a uh, plant-based chili product. Um, we, you know, recently launched uh, uh, an, uh, you know, an avocado, uh, ba- uh, avocado oil-based mayonnaise product, right? That basically takes the canola out of mayonnaise. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's, Certainly situations where we're like close to where the, where the right. third party products are. And in, in some cases, we actually work directly with the third party and as a, or the, the, the brand as a co-packer. Um, but there's a lot of scenarios for us where we're going in and we're actually plugging a hole. There also are, to be fair, some situations where we find uh, an area that like there's a product or a brand, but people aren't satisfied with it. Right. And then we're actually replacing it. So rather than competing, we'll say, all right, like it's time to move that product or brand off. We're going to put a Thrive Market branded product in its place. And then, you know, we capture those sales and, you know, that brand's not going to be happy, but our members weren't necessarily happy with the product to begin with. And obviously this is well-worn territory with Amazon basics and, and, um, you know, the Kirkland brand at Costco and, oh gosh, what's Target's brand up, up and away, I think, or. I mean, uh, Target now has do- yeah. literally dozens of brands. Okay. Um, really? So there's actually something else brands. That's we've now started to do where mm-hmm. all of our stuff, all of our food own brand is under the Thrive Market brand. But like last two years ago, we launched a supplements brand well-made. Uh, earlier this year, we launched Rosie, which is our home brand. We just recently launched Faye, which is our beauty brand. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're like, sort of capturing the, the, the loyalty to Thrive Market, but also creating brands that are purpose-built for their category. Do you also have physical stores or entirely only online? Entirely online, yeah. And, and I'm sure you've thought a lot about pros and cons of having physical stores. Talk us through that. We've, we've thought about it. You know, I think the, the strongest argument in my mind initially is just uh, uh, is more on the marketing side, right? It's mm-hmm. just like creating exposure and having a physical manifestation of the brand. So think like a pop-up store. Right. I think actually rolling out brick and mortar as a path to scale the business is quite challenging. I uh, just, it takes a lot of time. Like if you're going to get coverage on, you know, even, you know, 50% of the you know, U.S. consumer base, you're basically talking about 500 plus grocery stores, which is, you know, years and probably decade plus to, to grow. Um, you've got ma- major CapEx investment. 
Um, and you have to be able to have the density to justify it. So when we think about access, like online allowed us to one, access the entire country instantly. Mm -hmm. Two, we can access people like anyone where a FedEx or a UPS truck can reach, like we can reach. Right. Um, and you know that was also the reason that we circumscribed the catalog to focus on non-perishable products where that can work Easier with an online delivery model. Yeah, um, yeah it's so amazing how many online brands now are multi-channel, right? I mean, that have physical stores, Bonobos, Casper, um, uh, I feel like, you know, a parade, which is a, totally. a direct consumer undergarment company I'm an investor in. I mean, they now have stores like, um, it's Warby Parker. I, I mean, you name it. It's actually hard to find an online brand. That's only online. Yeah. I mean, the, for us, for us, it's, it, it's also just, there's so much growth still left online. Mm -hmm. Like I'm sure there's a stage where it could make sense for us to start thinking about it. Um, right. we're not, we're not close to the idea, but it's not top priority. Let's talk about managing through COVID. Um, what uh, what was that like? What happened to your business initially? And then how did you get through it? Just give us insight into the COVID experience for you. Yeah, I mean, I mean, like every every business, it, ours had a, a special version of crazy. I think <laughs> at, at the core, you know, it was actually a real moment for our mission, right? You know, you go from a world where some people are shopping online to like, everybody all of a sudden, at least during mm -hmm. the lockdowns had to be shopping online. You know, you went from a world where some people are thinking about their health to like, everybody is concerned about their health. So for us, it was, you know, kind of a acceleration of both of the secular wow. trends that we're betting on, uh, which meant more demand, obviously. Um, I think it was also this really challenging moment, especially early pandemic where, you know, there was still a lot of uncertainty about like the risk factors of COVID, you know, how, um, how basically how to protect people. And in our case, like we could send all of our corporate team home, but we've got 700 people in our fulfillment centers. Um, they have to come to like their, their work is in the, in the warehouses um, and their work is necessary to even get the products out. So our top priority early on was how do you keep those people safe? And we were super proactive on that. Um, and then our next priority was how do we serve our mission to both our existing members, as well as, you know, at risk people, especially who were unable to get groceries. So, you know, we gave out free memberships to senior citizens. Mm -hmm. We started a COVID relief fund where we were giving free memberships and stipends actually funded by member donations to, to provide groceries for families directly affected. So, you know, first thing, it was just this incredible moment for our mission. It definitely created growth. It was interesting for us, like as a membership model, our membership is actually a barrier to entry is one mm -hmm. way to think about it. So we didn't get like, like some of these like COVID beneficiaries, quote unquote, got these crazy inflections of basically one and done customers who are like, I'm going to use you during the lockdown or I'm going to use you for COVID. Um, and then they're kind of out the other end. For us, the membership is a forcing function to commit for a year. So we only, we didn't get people that just wanted like toilet paper and hand sanitizer. We only got people that actually were interested in what the Thrive Market Value Proposition was. So now we're coming down the other end of that, right? Things are normalizing. And what's been really heartening for us is seeing that we're retaining the members that we brought in during COVID and, you know, having a lot more resiliency than I think some other businesses that, uh, you know, went up in the pandemic, but then have really cascaded down since. Let's talk about the competitive landscape a little bit. When you woke up that morning and you saw Amazon was buying Whole Foods, what went through your mind? Uh, let's Honestly, I, I was probably just stunned. <laughs> I, I didn't see that one coming yeah. um, at all. Uh, but I think as we, as it, yeah, and, and then there was like the deluge of investors that were pinging us afterwards, like more or less thinking like this is going to be the end of you know this is this is like right. un un uh, unsurmountable hill. Um, but the truth is it, it was a really good thing for us in a strange way. Um, and the reason I say that? that, well, two, two reasons. One is the fact that they bought whole foods as opposed to another grocer is the ultimate signal of, you know, their belief of where the world is going. Mm -hmm. Um, so like Amazon is like the most mainstream, you know, broad based kind of business. The fact that they would make their play in grocery to be focused on a health and wellness and sustainability uh, focused grocery chain, I think tells you this is very much going mainstream and mass, which to me was a validation of, of, the, mm -hmm. of where we're playing. Um, but then the other thing which is interesting is 
you know, Amazon, basically Amazonified Whole Foods. Um, and if you think about Whole Foods as like carrying the baton for natural and organic retail in that kind of first wave, um, you know, it pr basically provided the opportunity for us to take that baton for the second wave. Right. And I think, you know, the second wave is going to take standards even higher. It's going to be more accessible and more broad based. Uh, and it's going to be online. Like, and, and to me, that was actually, uh, you know, the, sil the silver lining, if you want to put it that way, of, uh, of, of Whole Foods, you know, kind of uh, uh, handing, off, handing off the baton to us. In, uh, and do you mean that um, f from a product standpoint or more from a brand standpoint? Like have, have the products inside Whole Foods are they less green now than they used to be because Amazon is sort of watering down its Whole Foods commitment to this category? Or is it just that consumers are perceiving it that way because it's owned by Amazon? Um, I think it's both. So I think from a brand standpoint, like the fact that they're owned by Amazon changes the level of trust. It changes mm -hmm. the relationship to the communities um, in just a, you know, like you said, a brand or an optical way. Mm -hmm. But substantively, you know, they completely change the way Whole Foods buyers, uh, you know, curate and merchandise. Really? The stores. So Whole Foods was highly decentralized before. Um, and that was part of the whole, like, you know, con conscious capitalism mentality and being really stakeholder driven. Like you had literally the, the job title for these, um, these buyers at Whole Foods was foragers. And they were out there talking to like the earliest, most local, most interesting new brands. And a lot of that stopped under, under Amazon. Um, and like, I think Amazon probably made some real improvements to, to the, to the business as well. And I haven't, I haven't studied it closely, but what I will say is they now sell Honey Nut Cheerios. Um, there now are many, many brands that are launching on Thrive First that I think seven or eight years ago would have launched in Whole Foods First. Um, and I think the like consumer trust around what Whole Foods represents and what their standards are right. um, has has uh, you know, has attenuated. Um, and they've you know they have the, had the benefit of going more mass, but I think they've lost some of that authentic authenticity and credibility as the leader in natural and organic. Uh, last question or last topic, Nick, you've been in and around the LA tech scene for a long time. Uh, you live here, Thrive Market is headquartered here. Um, tell us about what LA tech means to you and how you've seen it change in the 15 or so years that you've been in the community. Well, like I said, I, I got here in 2011 and it didn't feel like there, I mean, maybe I just kind of missed it. Maybe it was already happening, but I didn't hear the word Silicon Beach for the first year that I was here. And then it was sort of 2012 when you had Launchpad LA and a kind of half dozen other startup accelerators that came up front really started to, like, I think, get more attention as a VC firm and a few others um, where you got, you had a VC uh, ecosystem, you had an accelerator incubator ecosystem, um, and then you had a few high, higher profile uh, startups that, you know, you got that ball rolling. And for me, you know, one being the beneficiary of that at Launchpad as an angel investor and as an entrepreneur has been, you know, something I'm just really grateful for. Like I can take no credit, right? I didn't choose to come to LA. I wasn't being strategic about it. It was complete dumb luck. Um, and then to be like, you know, in Santa Monica where revolution was headquartered, kind of put me in the epicenter of it, but it's been super fun to, to see it, to see it evolve. And, you know, I haven't spent time in the New York or San Francisco ecosystems, uh, you know, living there, um, but have seen kind of the vibe that they have. And I, I've, I've always loved being in LA as a place where it feels like the community is really tight. It doesn't feel like it's competitive or cutthroat. Um, and, you know, LA is an entertainment kind of, you know, in entertainment capital, if you will. I feel like that's like the vortex of intensity and being not in that, you know, it's like the equivalent of like finance in New York or, or startups in, in San Francisco. I feel like not being in that creates a vibe that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's not quite as intense as cut and, and cutthroat, but yet really productive with, it just attracts great people doing things for the right reasons. So um, it means a lot to me. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, thanks so much for your time. This is a great discussion and I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks, Spencer.